So hydrogen, is it the future? I still regularly get the man or the woman commenting on my YouTube channel saying EVs are not the future, it's hydrogen. The time when we can pull up to a hydrogen refueling station, fuel the car, all that comes out of the exhaust is water, hydrogen is the future. Well, let's go and have a chat to somebody who knows about hydrogen, Mr. Neil Kermode, and, and he was sort of instrumental in this project, the Surf and Turf project, where we looked at all the difficulties of producing and dispensing hydrogen as a fuel. So this is my good friend, Neil Kermode. I've been here on Orkney 12 years, and Neil is one of the first contacts I made when I came here sprouting off about EVs and electric vehicles. Yeah, that's about right. So for, for your sins, Neil, you're the joint chair of the of um, OREF, yeah. the Orkney Renewable Energy Forum. That's right. And then for your sins over the last, how many years? 19 years. 19 years you've been involved with a, an amazing um, group of people that try out new renewable stuff here on Orkney called EMEC. The European Maritime Marine, Marine Energy Centre, EMEC. And I'll put a link in the description below to visit their website as well. Um, so, hydrogen. Yeah. Lots of people think it's the future. Lots of people think it's not. Um, see, the man in the pub will get on the back of a beer mat and go, oh, EVs are not the future. It's going to be hydrogen because it's the most prolific substance known to man. It's water, you just chop it off, get the hydrogen bit, stick it in your engine, Bob's your uncle. It's not quite as simple as that, is it? No, it isn't. Um, and although we thought it was when we started. Yeah. <clears throat> so just in context, where we're standing is at a hydrogen refuelling station for vehicles, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. And this is part of a project called The Big Hit, which started in 2020. And Neil and EMEC and a vast array of other organisations got the European funding uh, for this project, which was probably several million pounds. Mm. Which is great because it enables, rather than the back of beer mat calculations, enables Orkney to actually try this stuff. And that's what we've done. So that's the context of where we are. So tell me, Neil, how easy is it to make hydrogen? Well, it's very easy to make hydrogen because you do just put electricity into water under the right conditions um, and the hydrogen and the oxygen disassociate, dissociate, and you end up with H2 and O. Yeah. Um, the, the, however, that's really where some of the problems then start because trying to keep hold of the hydrogen, to compress it, to store it, to move it around and actually to collect enough hydrogen to do something useful with afterwards, that is some of the, they're, they're some of the challenges. And some of the stuff we've done over, back over the years, um, both with this project, the, the Big Hit project, but even before that, there was another one called Surf and Turf, which this one was based on. Yeah. Um, it's been hard. It has been very hard. And, it, and there's a whole variety of reasons why it's hard. Yes. Um, and that's led us into some new thinking, so, yeah. uh, which I'll have you talk about. Yes. So one of the things we were talking about the other day when I was, was sort of doing a preamble about this video was one of the issues you faced, obviously, hydrogen has to be compressed into cylinders a bit like the cylinders you see divers using mm. or the cylinders that carry oxygen to hospitals etc but the pressures we're talking about here when you actually make hydrogen are huge aren't they yeah i mean you, you've got a choice as to which pressure you go to so um what we did here with this and the system we had that brought the hydrogen down, that ran at about 200 bar. Right. So that's basically 200 times atmospheric pressure, okay. which is similar to fairly old diving cylinders. Um, but if you're using hydrogen for other things, so for example, the Toyota Mirai, I think that compresses hydrogen up to 700 bar. Right. So that's over twice, near getting on for two and a half times as the pressure of a yes. diving cylinder. And that then brings some mechanical issues into play because the cylinders have obviously got to be strong enough to resist that pressure which is trying to burst out. Yeah. So mechanically, those high pressures are, are um, difficult to contain which therefore means the containment systems are quite big and heavy and solid. Yes. So it, 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 things start to escalate, the, the greater the pressure you put yes. it out. Yeah. Now you illustrated to me really well, um, you know when you had a bicycle pump and you'd, you'd want to pump up your, your bicycle tyre and the bit you were holding with the flexi bit on the end that went into the inner tube, if you held the end and you were pumping away, it got hot, yeah. it got really, really toasted. You probably remember doing that yourself. 
So when you go to compress hydrogen yeah. to squeeze it into this contained cylinder, what happens that you were telling me? Yeah, so, so the, as you say, if you start off with a cylinder in the car that's empty, and then you're going to put gas into it, and you're going to keep cramming the gas in it, and as you put more and more gas in, so the cylinder gets hotter and hotter and hotter. Yeah. And the problem with that is that that, that cylinder um, can get to very, very high temperatures. So in order to minimise that temperature rise, you can do two things. One, you can make the gas very cold before it comes in, um, which is something they do on, on some filling stations, not this one, but some more sophisticated ones. And they refrigerate the gas to minus 40. Right. It goes in and then it gets heated as it goes into the, into the cylinder. But the other thing is, because the cylinder gets so hot, there's a danger that it starts to damage the containment of the cylinder. Right. So the cylinder is generally metal with a with a wrap on the outside, which is a tape made out of Kevlar. And the problem with Kevlar is, if it gets very hot, it will actually denature. It, it loses its strength. Now it's a very good tensile material, but it gets too hot, it, yeah. it, de it denatures. So what they have to do with things like the Toyota Mirai is they limit the size of the cylinder in order not to get the, allow the temperatures to get too hot. So if you're just cramming it into a into a couple of kilogram cylinder, there's a certain amount of gas. If you double the size of the cylinder, there'll be twice as much energy, the cylinder will get, get even hotter. So yeah. by limiting the size of the cylinder and, and restricting the temperature at which the gas comes in, they're actually able to manage to get enough gas into the car to actually do the thing they want to do, like drive X hundred yeah. miles in it. But if you've got multiple cylinders, you've got, I'm guessing, multiple connections yeah. between the cylinders, yeah. which is another sort of failure point if you've got more connections. Yes. Yeah. Well, well, there's two bits there. One, you can't really go for a bigger cylinder because it will get too hot and yes. therefore the material will denature. Yeah. So the alternative is you say you have multiple cylinders and then they need connecting. And how do you connect them? Well, you connect them with pipes and bits and pieces, but then you've got a challenge because you're trying to then seal a pipe into a cylinder and that's basically you know, nuts and, and, and tightening stuff up. Yeah. But hydrogen also reacts with certain seals, so you really have to have metal-to-metal -metal contacts with a lot of this stuff. And if you've got a slight blemish on the steel or a scratch or something like that, right. then the hydrogen being the smallest molecule that we've got right. will tend to leak out through those holes. Okay. And similarly, these connections, there's a the cha you know, challenge that they become loose if you get vibration, you drive along roads. You, yeah. You, I'm not saying it can't be done. It's, there's just a lot to do. Just, it's not easy. Yes. It really is not easy. Yeah. And so the big, big thing we really came, the big conclusion we came to was that, look, if you can electrify something, electrify it. Yeah. So if you can electrify a car, electrify it. They work. Yeah. The, part of this system looked at putting hydrogen into some vans, which were part electric and then part hydrogen, and the hydrogen was then used to make more electricity when the van was going along. Yes. And it, and it worked. But it's really complicated. Yes. And it's yeah. actually easy to put a bigger battery in the van. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's really where we got to with a lot yeah. of this stuff. If you can electrify it, electrify it. And then if you can't electrify it, because it, the system will be too heavy or too bulky, then you need to do something else. And yes. hydrogen might be an answer, but there's other things you can do as well. Yes, yeah. Because we were talking as well last week about shipping. Yeah. We're using it to power ship. So we've got lots of ferries here on Orkney that, you know, we, they looked at bit being powered by hydrogen but again it's the same complicated mechanical yep. bits to store it and then transfer it, isn't it, it it is and you also got to realize that the power used to move a ferry is huge yeah and it's much much bigger so so there are ferries that come up from Aberdeen to Orkney and the, the engines in those are about 24 megawatt engines. That's about the same as the electricity supply for Orkney. Right. So there's yes. a couple of hundred people in a ferry coming yeah. to an island of 20,000 people, right. and the energy consumption is about the same. Right. Yeah. So, you know, ferries use a lot of energy. You're digging a big trench through the water. So it's not easy to do. So if you can do that, you need a lot of energy to make that happen. And then how do you get enough hydrogen into the ship to do the useful yes. thing? And yeah. that, once again, is a real challenge. Yeah. Not just because of what you've got on the the, the issues about the heat in the cylinders. The other part is, when the ship comes in and you've got to put more fuel in it, you've got to store all this hydrogen yeah. ashore to stick into yes. the ferry. Yeah. Where do you store it ashore in a safe yeah. way? Yeah. That's not easy. Yes. And it's interesting that uh, there was a previous episode of Robert Llewellyn's Fully Charged in 2017, 17, when yes. Robert came yes. up. Robert, you need to come back. Um, when Neil took Robert to E-Day, to talk about the big hit project surf and turf and what they were proposing to do with mm. hydrogen um, and, and tell me 
your, if you could go back in time now, what would you tell yourself <laughs> talking to Robert? Uh, I'll tell myself I'm going to get old. That's what I'd say. It's really depressing. Um, it, it was interesting because I, I did look back at it before coming here. And um, the big thing we were talking about there was about trying ideas out. Yeah. And that's absolutely still the case. Yeah. Because we tried this out on a very small scale. It was a half megawatt electrolyzer, you know, pretty small. Um, and we found out a lot of really valuable things from that. And quite a lot of things that happen with, with R&D is that works, but there's also quite a lot of, oh, that didn't work as well as we thought, or I don't think we should do that again. Yeah. And though, those lessons are also valuable, even the ones you choo did choose not to do again. Yes. Now, there's some of the things that we found with what we were working with, with um, trying to put hydrogen into ferries to, to run them for the engines. This issue of storage and the issue of transporting the gas into the boat and the act of storing it, we had underestimated the complexity of that grossly underestimated it and so but learning that at a small scale is great rather than yes. know, converting Southampton to hydrogen and then yeah. going oh hang on yeah. there's a problem I hadn't seen so you know doing it at small scale is really important um, sounds like I'm being defensive about what I said then I'm really not no. it's yeah. just that if you don't try yeah. you don't necessarily know but the important thing now is once you know something is make sure other people know it and yeah. in my head there's a sort of a, as a journey of discovery and we've wandered down a cul-de-sac and gone to the end of it and going, oh, hang on a minute, there's no way out of this. So we want to come back out of the cul-de-sac and put a sign up at the end of the cul-de-sac and go, it's a cul-de-sac. Yes. So don't accelerate down there. You know, and, and it's also about warning people what, where the limits of where we got to. So if somebody else can see a way around this problem, crack on, yeah. fill your boots, well yeah. done everybody, get past where, but this is where we got to, yes. these are the problems we had. So don't go into here not knowing where the problems are yeah and that's really what what we've done so it was great to to try these things but th this has led us into a whole different space which we think is also really really valuable yes that's right so we've been down the, the, the hydrogen route for, for for ships and boats and heavy industry um and cars so we've been down this cul-de-sac and that's what Orkney's famous for is just trying stuff out to then say to the rest of the world we've been there done that and it don't work or it does work what is the future for hydrogen in your view because i think this is quite interesting yeah. so so i think there are probably two distinct routes for hydrogen um we've looked at it as i say for vehicles we looked at it for aircraft yeah. in, in a gaseous form we looked at it for ships We've looked at it for heating for, for houses, and we really don't think any of those are, are very promising. We, just while we're at it, we didn't look at liquid hydrogen, because you can liquefy hydrogen, but frankly, that's really, really scary. Yeah, and okay. we thought, we're just not touching that. Yeah. It's beyond our capabilities, it'd be dangerous, so we're not doing it. But the thing we did discover was there's a guy called Pete Oswald, um, who lived in Orkney, um, who's a, 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 actually a, a friend, unfortunately. Yes died the other year yeah. it was a great tragedy but he came up with a, a process with his company called IGTL um, and they work with a company called Zero Petroleum where they took hydrogen and combined it with carbon monoxide and actually made synthetic gasoline right now so gasoline petrol yeah. so they basically made synthetic petrol out of hydrogen gas um, in a piece of kit that was smaller than we've got behind us here it wasn't mm. that it wasn't that sophisticated and that petrol they then supplied to the RAF, and the RAF then used that for their first ever fully synthetically fueled flight. Wow. Now the point is, if you, if you do that, and you use carbon you've captured out of the atmosphere, when you burn this fuel, the carbon just goes back to where you got it from. Yes. So you've not added to the carbon no. budget of the atmosphere. You've, you've borrowed the carbon, stuck it to some hydrogen, and it's nice and stable because you can yeah. carry it around in a jerry can. Yeah. And then when you want to use it, carbon goes back to where you got it from. So it'd be carbon neutral then? Carbon neutral. It's a very yeah. short carbon cycle. Yeah. Now, to make that all work, you need a lot of energy, mm. which we'll get from renewables, which yes. we've got a lot of. Yes. So Pete really led us to this, this new space, which is we think that hydrogen is able to be made from, from, from water and electricity as we've done. But as soon as you make the hydrogen, if you can stick it to something like carbon or even nitrogen to make ammonia, if you can stick it to something to make it more inert, it's easier to store, it's easier to handle, it's easier to carry about. And that's the, that's the space we think yeah. this is going into. Yeah, brilliant. That is fantastic. So I hope that's a little insight into hydrogen. So rather than just, you know, talking to your mates down the pub, and saying, I think we should be driving hydrogen cars. Hydrogen cars will fill in two minutes, none of this electric business. 
Orkney's been there, done that, and come up with absolute tangible results that shows there is tremendous difficulties. And because of the, the nature of hydrogen, I don't think there's any foreseeable future in it for road cars, no. um, as, as Neil said and has proved. But there is a future for hydrogen in the synthetic field of, of, of fuels. So thanks, Neil, for your pleasure, time. It's been pleasure. really good to, to catch up with good you today. You again, and, yeah, um, good yeah. So thanks to Neil Como for his time today to pop down and meet you at this hydrogen refuelling station, which is going to be decommissioned. But at least we've tried it. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And if you meet the man down the pub who says hydrogen is the future, feel free to pass this video on.